Why did God use a lying spirit to deceive Ahab? We are told of a story in the Bible where God used a lying spirit against Ahab. Is God indeed employing evil, lying spirits to do his bidding? Why would God do something like this? To solve the answer to this question, we must first learn about King Ahab and then understand God's sovereignty. King Ahab was Omri's son, who ruled over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. 1 Kings 16, 29 Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa king of Judah, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. Following in his father's footsteps, Ahab did evil in the eyes of God by worshipping Baal. 1 Kings 16, 33 Ahab also made the Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Ahab repeatedly proved he was bent on evil, evidenced by his continued refusal to listen to the prophet Elijah's warnings. Ahab accused Elijah of causing the drought to trouble Israel, but Elijah stated that Ahab's sin caused the drought. God repeatedly demonstrated his power and mercy to Ahab in subsequent incidents, but the king refused to submit and obey him. Finally, King Jehoshaphat of Judah visited him, and Ahab persuaded him to join the battle to take Ramoth-Gilead from the Syrians. Jehoshaphat wisely insisted on seeking God's will in the matter, so Ahab gathered 400 false prophets, all of whom assured him that God would grant them victory. 1 Kings 22, 6 New American Standard Bible So the king of Israel assembled the prophets, about 400 men, and said to them, Should I go to battle against Ramoth-Gilead, or should I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will hand it over to the king. Jehoshaphat was aware of their deception and inquired whether it was possible to consult a genuine prophet of God. Micaiah was a genuine prophet, but Ahab detested him because, as Ahab put it, he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. 1 Kings 22, 7-37 New American Standard Bible But Jehoshaphat said, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here, that we may inquire of him? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, because he does not prophesy anything good regarding me, but only bad. He is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, May the king not say so. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imlah, quickly. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting, each on his throne, dressed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chenanah, made horns of iron for himself and said, this is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Aramaeans until they are destroyed. All the prophets were prophesying this as well, saying, Go up to Ramoth-Gilead and succeed, for the Lord will hand it over to the king. Then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets are unanimously favorable to the king. Please, let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, I shall speak it. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, should we go to battle against Ramoth-Gilead, or should we refrain? And he said, Go up and succeed for the Lord will hand it over to the king. 
Then the king said to him, How many times must I make you swear that you will tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains, like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Each of them is to return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy anything good regarding me, but only bad? And Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the angels of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth-Gilead? And one spirit said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets. Then he said, You shall entice him, and you will also prevail. Go and do so. Now then, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, approached and struck Micaiah on the cheek, and he said, How did the Spirit of the Lord pass from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Behold, you are going to see how on that day when you go from one inner room to another, trying to hide yourself. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Amon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, This is what the king says. Put this man in prison and feed him enough bread and water to survive until I return safely. But Micaiah said, If you actually return safely, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Listen, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up against Ramoth-Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into the battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. Now the king of Aram had commanded the thirty-two commanders of his chariots, saying, Do not fight with the small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So when the commanders of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, Surely he is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. Then, when the commanders of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Now one man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel in a joint of the armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am severely wounded. The battle raged on that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot in front of the Aramaeans. And he died at evening, and the blood from the wound ran into the bottom of the chariot. Then the word passed throughout the army close to sunset, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his country. So the king died, and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. When Ahab committed a crime against Naboth, God had already decreed that he would be put to death for his transgressions. Elijah had found Ahab guilty of a crime, and he had passed judgment on him. The scene takes place in Jezreel, the location of Ahab and Jezebel's palace. A vineyard that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite was situated right next to the palace. Ahab had the idea to annex the vineyard and turn it into a vegetable garden so he pursued this goal. Since the law of Israel mandated that land stay within the family it was originally allotted, Naboth refused to sell or trade his property. 
When Jezebel found her husband vexed and gloomy and learned of Naboth's refusal to sell his vineyard, she assured Ahab that the vineyard would soon be his. She called a fast and a court of inquiry. Two evil men were appointed to charge Naboth with blasphemy against God and the king. Accordingly, Naboth was taken beyond the city and stoned to death. The dangerous Jezebel thus framed Naboth so that it would appear he was being executed for violating the law of Jehovah. Since the property would pass on to Naboth's sons after his death, Jezebel had them slain. The evil queen was as thorough as she was wicked. When Ahab was on his way to take possession of the vineyard, Elijah met him and condemned him for murder and theft. Elijah predicted that Ahab himself would be slain, ending his dynasty, that dogs in Jezreel would eat the body of Jezebel, and that Ahab's descendants would not be given a decent burial. The severity of Ahab's punishment is explained by the extremes to which he went in idolatry. There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness. When Ahab learned of his impending doom, he humbled himself before the Lord. As a result, the Lord decreed that the judgments on Ahab's wife and family would be delayed until after his death. If these verses teach us anything, God is a God of grace and mercy. Even Ahab's superficial repentance brought a respite. But the story here proves that his heart was unchanged. Grace was met by pride, so the Lord handed Ahab over to the angel of death. Following this conclusive rejection of God's guidance, God decided to carry out the death sentence. As Ahab persisted in putting more stock in the lies spoken by his false prophets than in the truth revealed by God's prophets, God decided to carry out his plan with the assistance of the false prophets. When God asked for volunteers to entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there, 1 Kings 22.20, a spirit, fallen angel or demon, said he would be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. God permitted the spirit to proceed, and Ahab received his desired message. God chose to use a lying spirit because Ahab rejected God's rebukes and cautions throughout his life, and the cup of God's wrath was full. Since God is sovereign over all creation, he is not limited in what or whom he can use to execute his holy purposes. His dominion extends over the entirety of creation, and he chooses to work through people and spirits, both good and bad, to bring his divine purposes into fruition and bring glory to himself. Daniel 4, 35 All the inhabitants of the earth are of no account, but he does according to his will among the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can fend off his hand or say to him, What have you done? In the case of Ahab, God chose to use a lying spirit to achieve his perfect and righteous plan. Psalm 18, 30 As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is refined. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. The lying spirit will be punished in the same way that Ahab was, and those who repent of their sins will be forgiven in the same way that Ahab could have. Will I respond to God's warnings with faith and obedience? Or will I reject his counsel and be rejected by him? Is the real question. When people continue to disobey God and harden their hearts toward his counsel, God will eventually subject them to the judgment appropriate to their actions. God is merciful and kind and will forgive all who came to him in humility. On the other hand, he is a just judge who will judge man's iniquity and hardness of heart. We can see many examples of this throughout Scripture. 
In Exodus 9.12, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. When Pharaoh resisted letting go of God's people and hardened his heart, God, in turn, hardens Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 8.15 But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Exodus 8, 32. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and he did not let the people go. According to the first chapter of Romans, because of man's ongoing disobedience toward God and the knowledge of God, they are given over to a mind that is debased, so that they may delight in the sin that they love and so face the judgment of God. Romans 1, 28, New American Standard Bible. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper. God sends a powerful delusion on all those who refuse to love the truth and be saved, so they may believe what is false and be condemned because they are delighted in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-12 The coming of the Antichrist, the lawless one, is through the activity of Satan, attended with great power all kinds of counterfeit miracles and deceptive signs and false wonders, all of them lies, and by unlimited seduction to evil and with all the deception of wickedness for those who are perishing, because they did not welcome the love of the truth of the gospel, so as to be saved, they were spiritually blind and rejected the truth that would have saved them. Because of this, God will send upon them a misleading influence, an activity of error and deception, so they will believe the lie, in order that all may be judged and condemned who did not believe the truth about their sin and the need for salvation through Christ, but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. It would appear that a wicked spirit was also present at this event. A similar circumstance may be seen in the book of Job, where Satan appears in front of the Lord. Job 1, 6 Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This spirit of lying is not counted among the heavenly host. Instead, it is counted among the group of the evil spirits, of which Satan is the leader. In point of fact, Satan is often referred to as the father of lies. John 8, 44 Amplified Bible You are of your father, the devil, and it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. Satan is also called the accuser of the saints. Revelation 12, 10, Amplified Bible Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom, dominion, reign of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our believing brothers and sisters has been thrown down at last. He who accuses them and keeps bringing charges of sinful behavior against them before our God day and night. We also see this in Zechariah 3, 1. Zechariah 3, 1. Amplified Bible. Then the guiding angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, representing disobedient, sinful Israel standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan 
standing at Joshua's right hand to be his adversary and to accuse him. Even though God used these evil spirits to bring about his judgment on those who deserved it, they will still be held accountable for the wrongdoing that they have committed. These examples from the Bible are a great warning to examine our hearts, to make sure we do not continue in the hardness of our hearts, but to come before God in humbleness. Otherwise, we can anticipate his just judgment. God is a just judge who only gives us what we deserve. Nonetheless, we see his amazing grace at work for all who seek him in humility and repentance. Psalm 92, 15 They are living memorials to declare that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promises. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Ahab was a man who delighted in listening to the lies told by the false prophets, and as a result, God decided to bring about judgment on Ahab through a lying spirit. He had a preference for evil over doing what was right, and he persistently disobeyed God. Therefore, God brings about the divine judgment he has reserved for him.